I think it's important just to give you uh, some background on, on the Wari, who we are, where we come from, what we actually do. Um, and then mainly I'm going to focus on the Navari Global Balance Fund. As Lawrence has said, it is a, a global fund. Um, I'll go into the structure of the fund just to put it into perspective um, where the fund is actually listed or domiciled. Um, I'm going to spend some time on, on the process and then we're going to look at performance and then lastly um, quite a bit of time on, on the underlying managers. I think it's also just important to mention to you now that the other presenters like Nolan, um, they do direct investment, so they will go out and buy that AB011 bond. Um, we at Navari, we buy into funds, so the Global Balance Fund is also a funder fund, and therefore obviously we do all our research on, on funds and combine the funds <coughs> in such a way that it makes sense and to create excellent performance hopefully. Um, so just some, some background on Navari. We started in 2000. Um, Johan and Derek started the business. Johan and Derek Roper. Both of them pretty much still involved with the business. Um, mainly in institutional business. So doing consulting with work to your larger pension funds. Um, that is still the largest part of the business, but yeah, as you know, through time, new things come up and we take opportunities in, in new areas. Um, and I think the business that I'm going to focus mainly on is Navari Investments. So Navari Investments is basically the investment arm of Navari. All the funds is managed within Navari Investments. It consists of, of three divisions there on the left-hand side. Um, my Benchop Fund of Edge Fund business. Um, again, a multi-manager business, purely fund of hedge funds, or so it's purely hedge funds. Um, I think one of the longest track records in fund of hedge funds within South Africa. I think that's perhaps a topic that we can come and discuss next time. Um, the hedge fund industry is also now regulated, so individuals can, can invest in hedge funds. I think it's a, a field that uh, um, Eugene Fasaghi has done some, some work with the FSB and with the regulators to get the um, the regulation out, so I think it's definitely something that, that we can explore in future. Then there's a multi-management business, that's domestic long-only products. Um, I look after that department within the Navari Investments. And then the offshore business, the topic for today. Um, the Navari Global Balance Offshore Fund, uh, Frans van der Merwe, he's looking after that portfolio. I'm also pretty much involved with, with that. Um, he can't be here, unfortunately. He's in the United States doing some manager due diligence there. Um, so yeah, I said I'll rather come and present to you than going to the States. Um, just assets on the management, as I said, it is, it is an institutional business, 220 billion rand of assets that we look after and advise on. Um, I think the main advantage for you as an investor is that we can pull these assets together into a fund, like the Navari Offshore Balance Fund. Um, we can negotiate fees on the back of the size, um, and we get quite decent fees from, from our um, underlying funds. Okay, so the Global Balance Funds, um, an institutional fund, as, as Lawrence has said. Um, just a few things on the fund. As I said, it's a fund of funds, so it makes use of underlying managers. Um, the benchmark is 60% in equities, obviously offshore equities, and 40% in offshore bonds. So no South African investment in, in this specific fund. Um, it started in 2004, so it's got a decent track record. Um, and yeah, the transfer fund member who looked off, or who's looking after the fund, he, was, he started with, with Nubari. So basically the track record you can directly say that is the work of Frans van der Merwe, as well as the rest of the team. Um, just the structure, I think it's slightly more detailed than um, what you would like to see. Just one or two points that I want to mention on this fund. Um, within South Africa, you've got a unit trust. Unit trust is regulated by the FSB, so they basically see that you don't um, include dodgy investments in your unit trust. This structure is offshore, it's Jersey domiciled. You've got a Jersey Financial Service Council that's looking after our fund, um, making sure that, that everything is kosher within the fund. Um, the custodian is BNP Paribas, 
um, probably one of the largest banks in the world. Um, the fund administrator is Moore, um, also quite a, quite a large administrator within, um, within the investment universe offshore. Um, so basically, I just want to leave you with this one point on, on this slide is, it's a proper offshore structure with proper governance from the Jersey Financial um, Service Board and custodian, one of the largest banks. So I think that should give you some comfort. Um, as I said, process, I'm quickly gonna, gonna touch on that. Um, for the offshore fund, the benchmark is 60% in offshore equities, 40% in offshore bonds. Um, so that's the benchmark, that's the objective that we would like to outperform. So the process starts off with the house view. So that's more or less, we do a lot of um, research, get graphs, get presentations. Some of the um, graphs that, that Pierre has shown earlier today, um, all of that we can combine into a, a, a house view committee to get an idea of where we see the world. Are we or do we want to be overweight equities? Do we want to be overweight bonds? Um, all of those information is combined to get us to our house view. Then, obviously, as I said, we are a fund of fund um, business, so it's offshore fund of fund. We have to make use of underlying managers. Um, and we cover 120,000 funds. Um, yes, we don't know every single one of them. Um, and that's partly or mostly the reason why you have to do quantitative screening. Um, you can screen, we do have an in-house in system. We screen those funds, get the, the criteria that we're looking for. Once we've got our universe of funds that we actually feel comfortable with, then we'll go on to the next step, which is the shortlist that we created. Um, shortlist, that uh, is doing a proper due diligence on the fund. So, as I mentioned now, our structure, where is he domiciled, who the, who's the custodian, who's the administrator, those are things that you have to do that. You have to check that you're not depositing your money into someone's bank account. It must actually be a proper fund. That is what the due diligence is there for. Um, then industry information, I think let's just assume there's one advantage of staying in Cape Town, and that is during the summertime, most of these managers come to Cape Town. Um, they call it on a working trip, but obviously <laughs> December, January, it's, uh, I think they're just having a little bit fun there in Cape Town. But the opportunity for us is there's probably three or four managers walking through our doors every single week. They want to come and see us. We don't have to go on all the trips. Um, they come to our office. And then obviously on-site visits. That's where my colleague is in why he is in the state. Um, again, we're never going to invest money with a manager if you haven't been to his office. We want to see that there is actually an office, that there is an investment team, um, how the process is working, and how they invest our money. Just quickly on, on performance, um, the last year has been an exceptional year for the fund. This is in US dollars. Um, I think the, the fund is an institutional fund. So obviously the investors, it's your pension funds, their time horizon is much longer than, than probably your retail um, investors. So important for us to focus on the, on the long term. And since inception, the fund outperformed the benchmark and also over three and five year period. Um, so we're quite happy with the performance. Um, cumulatively, also a nice gap opening up between our fund and, and the benchmark. Yes, there are some instances where we underperform. I think all fund managers will tell you, you can't be number one every single time. And the other thing that you must remember is in order to outperform the benchmark, you have to um, position yourself sometime differently than the benchmark. If we just stay 60% equities, 40% bonds, then guess what? We're going to get 60% equities, 40% bonds. So sometimes you have to deviate from the benchmark to get those returns, and hopefully over time the gap will open up. And that's luckily what happened. Um, Again, our universe is, is the offshore um, managers. We compare ourselves to offshore managers. Um, all of those black dots are offshore balance funds within the rest of the world. Um, our benchmark is there in, in black. Our fund is in, in green. So over a five-year period, we managed to outperform the benchmark. Um, and more than that, we outperformed most of the other offshore balance funds as well. 
Um, yes, we are slightly more um, aggressive or we do have slightly more risk in our portfolio. That's mainly because we include emerging market equities um, within our 60% equity exposure. So it's not just developed markets. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, I think the, the most important graph is, is this one. It's a rolling three-year period. So how to read this graph is I've taken all the balance funds, offshore balance funds, divided them into four different groups. If you're in the green part, then you top quartile. Um, you're on the top 25% of all balance funds. Um, and then obviously the gray part is you're the bottom 25%. Every single data point represents a three-year period. So if you look at January 2011, it's not the actual return of Jan 2011. It represents the three-year period prior to Jan 2011. So if you take that window and just roll that window over time, then you get data points for every single three-year period. Um, and the nice thing to see is that we're consistently in that top quartile. I think that is the the place that, where everyone wants to be. Um, Alexander Forbes, they produce a, a survey. Um, unfortunately, it's mostly slightly outdated. So December 2014 is the latest one available. Um, on a one-year number, we're top of the chart. I think more importantly, over a five-year number, um, we're sitting in third position. Um, obviously just comparing us against the South African managers. I've compared us against all the other global um, managers, this is just the South African managers that's doing more or less the same. And then lastly, over seven years as well, um, managed to, to be one of the, the better balance funds. Um, so I've touched on the, the process, I've touched on performance, um, I think portfolio positioning, um, I've got one slide on that. As I said, the benchmark is 60% equities, 40% bonds. So obviously, if you're bullish on equities, you're going to go overweight equities. So just by looking at this, this chart, we're sitting at, let's call it 66% um, in equities. So basically, 10% overweight our benchmark. So that will give you an indication that we're fairly bullish on, on equities. Um, if I may just leverage off Pierre's presentation, um, we also think that the United States is, is starting to improve. Um, there's more people that gets employed. That means there's more people earning money. That means there's more people that can go out and shop, buy goods and services. Those goods and services needs to be reduced. So manufacturing is starting to kick in. And there you see the whole economic cycle in the United States starting to, to turn. That's why we're bullish on, on um, US equities. Yes, it is not that cheap anymore. But we still think that there's some, um, some room for more improvement there. Um, going over to Europe, you've seen this chart of, of Pierre. Um, I think Europe, let's say it's in a better position than what it was a year ago. They still have some, some way to go to get to the same level as the United States. Um, but even there, we're, we're starting to see opportunities. China, um, you can remember that chart of China, the drop in their GDP. Yes, it is a drop, but they're still producing at the, at the GDP level of north of, of 7%. Um, so still decent returns. And then we combine it with some emerging market exposures as well. Um, emerging markets, we cover uh, South America, we cover China, we cover Brazil, um, Latin, and then a new fund is Middle East, North Africa. So we're starting to go into the um, Saudi Arabia. Their market will be opened up for, for foreign investors, so we see very nice opportunities there as well. Um, Fixed income, that's uh, more or less what, what Nolan has presented on. Um, our benchmark is to be 40% in, in fixed income. Currently, we're sitting at 28.1%, so a fair amount of underweight there. Um, yes, there are opportunities in the fixed income space, as Nolan has, has mentioned. Um, we're on the cautious side at this stage. So let's just look at the underlying funds. Um, this morning, I quickly went onto the internet download a, a statement of um, Global Select, which is the platform that one of the asset managers um, provide. So we as South Africans can go onto the platform, invest in those funds. I've counted the funds. Um, I see there's 37 different funds that one can select. Of that 37, it's managed by 12 
asset managers. So we as South Africans, we've got a choice of 37 funds managed by 12 asset managers. That's it. As I mentioned before, we cover a, a range of funds of 120,000 funds. It's all global funds. It's not just your big South African companies that we all know very well. Um, so we've got the opportunity to invest of funds that probably no one will ever heard of, or never have been heard of. Um, artisan Global Value Fund, um, Franchise Partners, I think that's probably one fund that's more well known. Um, Epic Global Choice, again in the United States, I'll be very surprised if everyone has ever heard from them. Um, and then the Emerging Markets, the Value Partners Fund in, in China. Um, just perhaps on emerging market, the approach that we take is we invest in managers who is actually sitting within the country. So our China exposure is managed by a manager who is sitting in China. The same applies for India, Latin America, and the ASEAN fund. Um, again, China, only 6.3%. Excellent opportunities, but we're also aware of the risk. Um, that's the reason why we, we're only limited to 6.3%. To India has done very well for us. Um, we've taken some profits on that. Um, it's a manager sitting in India. He knows the market. He can speak the language. He knows the companies. Um, I've already mentioned that we're looking at in employing a MENA fund, the Middle East North Africa fund. Um, yes, most of those countries are oil producing companies. So you can imagine what will happen to to them, or what has happened to them with the oil coming off, but they've had this period of excellent, excellent returns with the oil price being north of uh, $100. So they've got, their balance sheet is so strong that at this stage the oil price doesn't really bother them. Um, Francis van der Merwe been to, to MENA earlier this year as well and he came back and he said the amount of development that's going on in Middle East North Africa is just amazing. They're building um, airports twice the size of our Tambo, and then it's just a local airport. So it's really, they're hosting the Soccer World Cup in 2022, I think. Um, obviously, we've seen what happened to South Africa when we hosted the Soccer World Cup. So decent opportunities in, in MENA as well. Fixed income, um, Franklin Templeton, Lonis, I'm glad you met the guys from Franklin Templeton. We used them um, quite a, a big exposure on the fixed income side. And then ACPI Global Credit Fund, I'll touch on them also. And then the Navarre Africa Property Fund, Fund 1 and Fund 2. Um, remember Fungai's presentation? He presented on, on Nigeria, Lagos, specifically uh, Leki. Um, I'm pretty sure the mall, the pictures he showed you on that, on that screen, is the mall that Navarre has built there. Um, at this stage, it's not a listed fund, so it's unlisted private equity investments. Um, the whole philosophy is to go into Africa, buy up land, build shopping malls, um, and then through time, we'll exit it. We've got a very nice relationship with ShopRite. So ShopRite don't want to take on the development risk. Um, they wait for us to do the development. Once the mall is up and running, they'll come in as an anchor tenant, and then obviously we will use the locals as well for um, to well, rent some space in the mall. Um, so fund one and fund two, we support that through our offshore fund. And then lastly, just cash. So I'm going to touch on, on the funds um, just to get you, give you some insight on what they actually do with your money. Obviously, different processes to each of the underlying funds, but the combination is working quite well. That was the performance that I've showed you earlier. So firstly, independent franchise. They're based in London. Um, they philosophy or their process is to outperform the MSCI World Index, so obviously an equity benchmark that they want to outperform. Um, it's probably the most defensive equity fund that we've got in the mix. Um, they, their philosophy, buy great businesses at compelling value. Um, yeah, I think that's more or less the philosophy of all the um, guys is to buy great businesses at, at compelling value. What it actually means is these guys go out and they buy strong franchise business. So if I take you through their portfolio, you'll see the names like eBay, um, Apple, Samsung, Dr. Pepper, they're producing fizzy drinks in, in America. Um, Kellogg's will be one, Nestle, a big exposure to Nestle. 
um, British American tobacco, which you all know that will be in their portfolio. So it's strong franchise businesses. What that means is, is businesses, they've been around for a lengthy period of time. It's not easy to replicate those businesses. So you can't just come in and say, okay, today I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to compete with Nestle. Um, if you want to do that, I think good luck to you. Those businesses have been around for a long time and they're producing a high free cash flow. What that means is those businesses are strong. Their balance sheet are strong. So they've got cash on the balance sheet and they pay that back to investors. So if you stay invested, you'll, eat, you'll earn this high um, free cash flow yield. Um, it's companies with good track record, as I said, properly managed, stable companies. They'll just keep on compounding, compounding, compounding. Um, to buy an old strategy, 20 to 40 companies. Um, I think Warren Buffett's philosophy also um, don't over diversify these guys, only 20, 20 to 40 companies, um, high conviction companies, and we've been invested with this fund from the start of our global balance fund. The last point, probably the most important one, it's close for new, new investors. Um, so as you, if you've got a lot of money and you want to invest in this fund, um, you're welcome to go to London and ask them to, um, to take your money. They close for new investors, they won't do it. So the only way that you can access this fund is through um, guys that's currently invested with them. Um, so there's an opportunity, go to the Novari Global Balance Fund and you'll get exposure to them. Um, just the performance that they've produced, um, being this defensive manager investing in high quality companies, you'll expect them to perform better during times like 2008 where there was a massive drawdown. Um, it's usually in those massive drawdowns that your, your quality businesses doesn't fall as much as, as your non-quality businesses. And that's exactly what we want this fund to do, is to protect capital when things go wrong. Um, but fortunately, they also keep up with the market when the market is running. Um, so of all of those periods, I think there's one or two years that they underperform the index. Um, exceptional manager, um, perhaps. Just a quick story, I, I went to their offices a year or two ago and as we walked in, the portfolio manager said, no, his son is, um, unfortunately, his son is ill, he have to go to the hospital. And Well, we came from, from South Africa to see him and, yeah, unfortunately that happened. He said, don't worry, I'll quickly call the analyst. We had a meeting with the analyst over and off and he knows the portfolio off by heart, every single investment, every single yield on every single company. Um, that just gives you satisfaction that there's a whole team, there's a whole operation behind it. It's not just a portfolio manager. Um, so yeah, I think the, the second equity manager is Epic Global Choice. They're based in New York City, so that's where Francis van der is today. Um, yeah, in, in New York City, more or less the same strategy as franchise partners, also focusing on this quality business with our high um, free cash flow. But where they differ from the franchise partners is they'll take more a, a broad um, macro view on, on companies um, and they invest in, in certain themes. Um, so a theme that they had in the portfolio a while ago was the aviation space. Um, they thought that uh, that was a good time to, to invest. They've done some research. They think, okay, that's the space where we want to be. Then they went on and do the analysis on the companies and they bought quite a bit of Boeing. Um, much more frequent trading in, in this fund. Um, they'll be in and out of, of companies more often than, than, in, than franchise partners. Um, but again, high conviction, only 25 to 35 stocks. We want them to sit around the table and create a portfolio of their high conviction. So that's why 25 to 35 companies, you can imagine their universe is thousands and thousands of companies. To pick just 25, you have to have high conviction. Um, higher portfolio turnover, as I said, um, but again, quality companies with high free cash flow, but slightly more active on the trading. And then the other, uh, just the performance from, from Epic, um, also decent performance even in 2008, didn't protect that much capital, but at least outperformed the index. 
Um, but then in the strong markets, they, they also outperform quite nicely. The last developed market manager that we have is, is Artisan Global Value. Um, so it's a recent addition to, to our fund, Artisan Global Value. Um, well, it just gets better. They're based in San Francisco. So my colleague is probably off to San Francisco as well. Um, yeah, as I said, it's in the name value, value companies. Um, so more the Warren Buffett approach that was the previous presenter just presented to you. Um, looking for that intrinsic value, getting companies that's, that's cheap, um, sell high, buy low, that whole philosophy. Um, quite a small, small house. They only, I think, 20, 20 billion in, in US dollars. Um, so a boutique type of, of manager. Um, seven investment professionals. Um, but as I said, long-term value investors focus on companies with financial strength and good management team that can unlock value. That whole thing of buying a company that will, through time, get to its intrinsic value and investors will benefit. So, from our developed market managers, two of the guys, more defensive, high quality, high free cash flow yields, and then lastly, a, a guy that uh, is more value, value type of, of strategy. Um, and you'll expect this company to, or this uh, value strategy to perform Obviously, through, through cycles, value is not always the best investor, but then obviously you've got your high quality side of things to it as well. Um, performance also, also really well. Um, I think they actually also closed for, for new investors. Um, they want to remain small. That, as I said, they're a boutique type of manager, only 20 billion US dollars. They want to remain small, they've closed for, for new investors. Just the upside and downside capture, what this just basically tells you is if the market rally, how much does the equity manager rally with the market? And you'll see there that global choice um, is almost 90%. So 90% of the upside um, is that they capture that. Independent franchise, yes, it is slightly lower, 86%. But again, why did we include them in the portfolio? is for that defensive nature of the, of the fund. And it comes through in your downside capture. When the market falls, they only fall 80% of the market. Um, artisan value, again, the value, different strategy. You expect them, when the market run, they'll run with the market, but they won't give you that much um, protection on, on the downside. So 87% of the downside. That's the, the game that we're in. We're looking for, invest, for funds that when you combine them, they give you a nice, nice solution. Um, moving over to the bond space, remember our benchmark was 60% equities, 40% bonds, so this is our bond manager's Templeton total return. Um, I think probably one of the largest fixed income managers in, in the world, um, their fixed income team, over 100 members worldwide. So they know a lot of countries, they know not a lot of countries, um, bonds, the yields that you can get, um, they're actually very good with investing in different currencies and edging out currencies. Um, and the opportunity set includes corporate credit. Um, I think the, the main thing for Templeton Total Return that, that we like at this stage is interest rates. We've seen it previous presenters' presentation as well. Interest rates are so low that you have to give your fixed income manager as much opportunity to create value for you. So they can invest in sovereign bonds, they can invest in credit bonds, they can invest in currencies. Um, their duration is, is very low at this stage. Um, they actually have a lot of cash in their portfolio as well um, to protect the, the investors for when interest rates rise. Um, they take a view of 12 to 18 months. I think at this stage also quite important to have a short-term view because those rates can rise quite quickly. Um, but all in all, Quite a strong team, um, one of the well-known fixed income managers that we have in, in our portfolio. And performance-wise, I think that's decent performance from, um, from bonds. Yeah, I think over all the, the periods, they performed really well, um, generated a lot of returns for, for, our, for our fund as well as our investors. ICPI Global Credit Fund. Um, it's more a defensive fund than, than Templeton. Um, obviously, as the name suggests, they invest in credit, so they'll lend money to, to corporates. Um, 
Stephen O'Hanlon is an Irish guy based in London. Um, phenomenal guy to meet and spend some time with. Um, his, his views on the market is just amazing to listen to. Um, also more of a boutique type of business. They're not that, that big as the Templeton Total Return Fund. Um, but again, that gives them more opportunity to be more flexible within their, within their investments, in and out of positions more quickly. Um, much more on the defensive side than Total Templeton. Um, so again, we more or less replicate what we've got on the equity side. You've got your guys that's, that's defensive for fixed income, it's ACPI, um, the defensive fund, and then the fund that can play around more and take more opportunities like Templeton Total Return. Um, benchmark is LIBOR plus three, that also gives you, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, plus two and a half, that also gives you an indication of they're not chasing bond returns, it's a cash plus type um, strategy. But the combination with Templeton is actually quite a good one. Um, just their performance as well, um, that's against the bond index. As I said, the, their benchmark is actually cash plus. So you don't expect them to outperform bonds all of the time, but even with that benchmark over the last couple of years, um, when we see interest rates starting to rise, um, these guys has definitely done very, very well. Um, bonds, I think a lot have been said about bonds and when interest rates rise and the risk, obviously Nolan has pointed out that, they, that there are definitely opportunities to, to take when interest rates rise. Um, for us, important to outperform the benchmark, and I just think to show you over the last year, um, the gray line is, is the bond index, and our two fixed income managers, um, they kept on performing when the, when the bond market came under pressure. Um, again, the combination, the way that they look at the world, um, we're happy with that, and that's obviously why it's in the portfolio. Um, just some more stats on, on the bond managers. Um, I think I've touched on most of this. Um, perhaps just the, the top um, picture there is the returns. You expect ACPI to, re, to give a lower return than Templeton Bond. As I said, more cash type manager. Um, important one for us again. We're fund to fund managers. We want to combine portfolios. Correlation between the two managers, um, 0.3 and 0.4%. That just means how they move together if they are highly correlated, like one, then if the one returns 1%, the other one will also return 1%. One, 1%. Um, low correlation means, obviously, they move in different directions, exactly what you want from a manager. If the one underperforms, you want the other manager to outperform. Um, that comes through in your, in your low correlation. Um, and I think this is probably my last slide. Just touch on, on fees. Um, remember I started off by saying Nevada is an uh, institutional player. Um, we obviously also offer retail portfolios, but the whole portfolio was created for our pension funds. And the main reason for that was if you've got 220 billion rand of assets, combine those assets into a portfolio, and then you go and negotiate with Franklin Templeton independent franchise. If you just take five or six different pension funds and try to negotiate a fee for every single one, um, they won't give you the same fee as combining it. Economies of scale at the end of the day. And I think for offshore product that um, has performed exceptionally well, the, the fees, I think to get this fund for 1.2% for um, total TR um, is actually quite cheap. Um, but again, the, the economies of scale is the important thing. Um, yeah, I think just to summarize, it's an offshore product, fund of fund, um, make use of, of equity managers and fixed income managers. It is available for, for Optimum to, um, to use. Um, importantly, you're not just restrained to, to the well-known asset managers within South Africa. Our scope and our universe is, well, the 120,000 funds. So it's just a different ball game. It's a pure offshore fund, US dollars, um, and yeah, I think it's, we, yeah, we can be very proud of, of what we achieved with this. Thank you.